Namaskar and welcome to all the viewers. I'm Dev Subhi Adhwanshi and this is Democratic Dialogues. Today we are joined by a person who does not need a lot of introduction, Dr. and Professor Ram Punyani ji. He, he is a luminary when it comes to the medical field. Uh, he, he has been at the forefront of so much of activism work, human rights work. And, uh, you know, in efforts to maintain secularism in this country. And over the years, he has become such a well-known name because he started speaking up when nobody was speaking about the issues that we were witnessing in this country. So it is an absolute honor, sir, to welcome you to our channel. Thank you. Thank you. So, sir, my first question to you, um, you know, you've been at the forefront of fighting Hindu fundamentalism in India, especially at a time when it was not a mainstream concern as it is today. Can you tell us why you chose to speak up rather than keeping quiet? See, uh, when uh, Babri Mosque was demolished, <clears throat> actually we have been witnessing communal violence earlier also. Uh, from 1916, 70, and in the 80s, there were a lot of communal violence. But uh, I was not so disturbed by that. I thought as society progresses, they'll be taken care of because ultimately these are superficial social issues and they may not affect our country so much. But uh, 6 December 1992, when Babri Mosque was demolished, I realized that uh, this communal violence, which is hiding communal politics, which can also be called Hindu fundamentalism or Hindu right wing, that is out to destroy our democracy. Now, I have come to an understanding that social change towards equality can take place only in a democratic setup. So let me repeat, I realized that Hindu right wing, Hindutva, Hindu nationalism is out to destroy India's democratic fabric. And my understanding is that social march towards equality can take place only in democracy through social movements. So after that, till that time I was trying to associate along with my job, I was trying to associate with the union movement. That day, I decided that I will try to understand Hindu fundamentalism, its dangers, and I could see that uh, it has a lot of similarity with what happened in Germany and Italy. I could see that it is targeting Muslim minorities today, but it will also target Christians, Christian minorities also. And uh, along with that, the rights of the Dalits, equality of women, and uh, a decent place for Adivasis that will also be hampered. And these were my primary concerns, primary areas of concerns that in our society, these are the marginalized sections who should be given equality, whose, whose struggle for equality should be respected, supported, and encouraged. So from that day on, I thought, okay, I will try to first understand this uh, whole phenomenon of fundamentalism and then to try to Talk, talk about it, make people aware about it through books, through lectures, through seminars, through workshops. And that's how the journey began in talking about this. Okay. Especially why I, I wanted to personally uh, uh, you know, ask you this question because, um, you know, uh, so of course, sir, you are much older than me. I'm also one of the few people maybe across the country who, who was speaking about this, like even before Narendra Modi came to power in 2014. So for my generation, a lot of people were saying like, you know, why are you so negative about this man? He's going to come and uh, do a lot of development. But when you know the ideology of Hindu fundamentalism, you cannot ignore the glaring uh, reality that's going to come your way. So I, I completely agree with you uh, on that. Which brings me to the second question, sir. Um, Hindu fundamental, uh, fundamentalism that we see today has its firm roots in the attempt to re-establish Brahmanical hegemony under the garb of protecting Hinduism 
from being obliterated by the minorities. So how do you view this phenomenon? Can you shed some light? Actually, I must say this question has been very well formulated. And uh, the use of the word Brahminical hegemony is very appropriate. Basically, this uh, Hindu fundamental on one side, its essential core is Brahminical values. Like I will say that uh, Hindu fundamentalism has two feet, two feet. One is the maintenance of Brahminical hegemony, Varna caste system, is one foot, and the other foot is targeting the minorities and pushing them to a power. So these are the two uh, feet on which this Hindu, Hindu fundamentalism walks. So it has nothing to do with Hinduism. That let me tell you. Hinduism as practiced by large section of uh, Hindu community in the India. And of course, what to say of anybody else? The greatest Hindu of 20th century, Mahatma Gandhi, was the first target of Hindu fundamentalists. While Gandhi himself said, I am a Hindu, I can give my life for my religion, but that is my personal matter. And there is a Hindi phrase, uh, a song which was his favorite, Vaishnava Janato Tenire Kaye Je Peer Parai Janade. Now, what does this mean? This basically means that if you are a Hindu, compassionate Hindu, compassion for others has to be the central point of practice of your religion. And this Hindu fundamentalism basically begins with the hatred for Muslims and from the decade of 1990s, hatred for Christians also. That is a marginal phenomenon, but not so marginal because there is a very complexity involved. But they regard Christians and Muslims as foreigners. Obviously, in the modern world or in any world, no religion is a native or a foreigner. Religion is basically a universal value, universal value. Buddhism, which originated in India, is maximally followed in Thailand, Sri Lanka, Myanmar, Southeast Asian countries. And today you won't find a single country in the world where Hindus are not there. Right? So religion doesn't have nationality. That point, these people try to connect them. That in India means Hinduism, Hindustan, Hinduism, that's what they try to feel. So they have nothing to promote the moral values of Hinduism. For saying, say, they will say Vasudev Kutumukam, but in their shakhas and other places, they have already made a huge uh, ground for creating hate against the minorities. And of course, I must say, hate is a foundation for violence. I understand. If there is no hatred, violence cannot be instigated. They are able to instigate Absolutely. violence only because they have cultivated hate for over a century, nearly a century. And this is totally against the essence of Hindu values. The Hindu values as practiced by Gandhi and large sections of uh, Hindus in India. And sir, you know, what I've noticed, you mentioned the beautiful adage Vasudeva Kutumbakam. Uh, when one even reads the Upanishads, like I've uh, studied the Isha Upanishad, and it talks about the oneness that connects everything. You know, these are the sort of very deep and profound, uh, you know, learnings that we have in Hinduism. I, I think somewhere like if you are actually truly a practicing Hindu and you focus on what what our culture and heritage is, you can never hate another human being. It's it's just not possible. No matter what the person's background is, you know. Very, um, very. All right. That brings me to the next question, sir. Hindu majoritarianism in the past decade has increased with the help of mainstream media and so many other factors we've seen. What are your views on the creation of this myth and its character? See, uh, I think as you correctly point out, there are many other factors. Mainstream media is one. And I also must tell you, Indian media had its glorious heights 
in the decade of 50s and 60s when when a cartoonist like shankar could criticize the prime minister jawaharlal nehru and jawaharlal nehru would invite him for tea and would say don't spare me that was the time when our media was its had to sin now once modi became chief minister of gujarat he invited the corporate section and since then the corporate started taking up the media so as ravish kumar has correctly pointed out it has become a godi media lap media for the corporate and corporate and communal these have a deeper alliance you see similar phenomenon in germany also when uh, these forces came to power media was totally hand in glove with them so other factors which have created is that uh, there is something called shakha i hope you can understand what is a shakha there is a particular role yes and in these shakhas the mornings when they call children for playing and all that that is followed by shakha pothik once a week or so and then i must compliment those forces that they have been so consistent in their goal weekly brain uh, brain washing then monthly programs three monthly program yearly program uh, training program for workers for work. so those they create features pracharaks and these pracharaks have infiltrated most of the walks of our life so media one side corporates control it second is these features have entered there then our state apparatus judiciary bureaucracy police force these have infiltrated then there is a chain of schools called saraswati shishu mandir ekal vidyalay and they have tried to control our curriculum and in few curriculum you see that they are removed einstein and darwin so the theory of evolution and uh, even periodic table is out and the main theme which they are trying to come that in ancient period hindus had all the knowledge interplanetary travels and uh, this uh, uh, travels by like aeroplane and all that they don't mention air hostesses and air forces but air <laughs> just very lovely then our prime minister goes to tell us that we had a plastic surgery surgery where here elephant's head could be planted on human head so all these things they have tried to percolate through education through social mechanisms and through the community work they do a lot of community work and in this community work along with the community work these sort of values are also inserted by and by so that uh, media is one which is correctly called body media body media is lab media media sitting in the lap of the corporate giants and then there are all the supplementary factors features are there swayam sevaks are there then chain of uh, shishu mandirs are there books have been doctored books have been modified you must be remembering uh, yogendra yadav and professor suhas balshikar they have uh, written to ncert that please remove our name from the advisory board because we do no longer identify with the books which we had originally planned so this whole thing has created a sort of what i call social common sense this social common sense is a default understanding of the society unless i and it is a mainstream flow which most of the people believe unless you go in the stream and try to put your point it is difficult for these things to be taken to the people and second thing is of course there is a failure on the uh, side of the progressive forces left forces centrist forces in fighting the danger posed by this sort of a continuous propaganda from last several decades the propaganda directed against the weaker section of society the propaganda which glorifies the values of manusmriti type in a in a very sophisticated way so that's why we are in the present mess yeah and and so uh, a medical analogy comes to mind that uh, the work that they've been doing it's like a, it's like a chicken pox virus which is they you know stagnant in the body uh, <laughs> in a state of stasis for quite some time 
and you know you think everything's all right and suddenly it flares up and it takes over the whole body so yeah. <laughs> i mean how they came up suddenly and i i do believe that if if maybe we would have had a much stronger um, you know focus on the development of scientific temper on on uh, understanding how there exists a dichotomy between what people are studying via education and what the society is tempering them to be or kind of condi- conditioning them to be the dichotomy and the chasm uh, the schism between both uh, just started increasing and you know what we termed as fringe elements uh, just a decade ago has become mainstream uh, in the in this uh, short span of time so yeah <laughs> it's uh, yeah it's a lot of things that have come together to make this happen my next question so and we cannot of course ever ignore the caste factor in india uh, so caste factor has become more pronounced under the resurgence of hindu majoritarianism um, what is the correlation here can you shed some light on this matter yeah see first is that we have to see the origin of communal forces and i would like to inform friends that in the decade of 1920s and 1910s during the colonial period uh, due to the efforts of dr ambedkar jyotirao phule savitri bai phule the dalits started showing their rights asking for their rights so the various movements started coming up for caste equality ambedkar called for caste annihilation in due course so when this dalits started coming into the social sphere the elite criminal and uh, their supporters they got disturbed and that what led to the formation of rss that was one of the major factors and the elite mainly brahmins when they saw that even dalits are coming up and trying to try to be the equal to us try to participate in the freedom movement try to ask for their equality this is a this rings a danger bell for us so then they came together from rss and called for hindu rashtra called for uh, all of those things so that is the beginning second is that during last many decades because of some reservation policy some success not total success some success of reservation policy dalit started coming up in by 1980 they had a sizable presence in the society sizable uh, say in the society so the upper caste elite mainly led by this organization they came up they brought up the issue of ram uh, uh, religion like the classical words they were to once mandal was brought in mandal was one of the major steps in bringing social justice so when mandal was brought in the rath yatra for ram temple construction demolition of babri mosque became stronger and the mind you one interesting thing when uh, atal bihari vajpayee who supposed to be a moderate case but i don't regard him as moderate i thought he was the cleverest cleverest rss guy they were we had so that time when uh, this uh, mandal commission report was implemented 26% reservation was given to obc after that advani's rath yatra for ram temple ki hai and advan when vajpayee was asked what is happening why a political party is working for temple so vajpayee said and he very significantly said oh they have brought mandal so we have brought kamandal <laughs> they yes. have brought mandal so we have brought kamandal so basically uh, the politics of this hindu nationalism also aims to ensure that caste equality doesn't come in the forces which work towards caste equality are gradually strengthening so how to keep them in check the biggest check is religious hysteria so you talk for jobs you talk for bread butter shade or employment so you hear the answer no we will have ram temple Glorious Ram temples will take you to the trip to the Ram temples. Be satisfied with it. So this is the principle of battle between uh, Hindu nationalism and against the battle to have 
subtle preservation of caste inequality. Subtle it is not blunt. Like whenever they are in power, last decade you can see that gradually they brought in reservation on the basis of economic backwardness. So what will happen? The reservation will get diluted. So mm -hmm. similarly in universities, whenever in universities there is a provision for post should be reserved for Dalits and all that, they by and large started bypassing it as they have infiltrated education. Most of the vice chancellors, as Rahul Gandhi says, belong to that school of thought. And in those universities also, the reservation meant for low caste Dalits is gradually not implemented in practice. Theoretically, don't oppose, but practically, you do things where this caste inequality continues to be. So, communalism, communal communalism, has a central goal of uh, keeping alive the caste and gender inequality. Let me add gender also. Gender is no less important Absolutely. in these matters. And you see the struggle for uh, gender equality, beginning with Savitri Kule, then in the decade of the 80s, Indian feminism also came up, demanding for equality in so many spaces. Today, of course, it's a long history, but this is also something in contrast to this. Uh, RSS talks about uh, preserving our glorious past, glorious family traditions, and uh, they don't regard even now women as equal beings. How do I say that? They are Rashtra. Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Sang, exclusively male organization. Yes. What is the name of their women's organization, which is subordinate to them? In the Yuva Vahini. Rashtra Sevika Samiti. Rashtra Sevika Samiti. So here the word Swayam is missing. Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Sang, Rashtra Sevika Samiti. So, swayam of women is supposed to be in the pocket of men. So, that is a, in roughly how we like put. So, the caste and gender inequality doesn't come up as a it's part of the agenda. Absolutely. Sir, as the, you know, I'm adding to this question, there's an observation that I've seen. On one side, uh, you know, they play the religious card that you know the minorities are going to eat up everything uh, hindus have got uh, a reservation as ovc they're going to eat the ovc and dalit reservation they they pit hindus versus uh, the minorities but on the other side you see that almost every i would say every communal strike or a riot or any thing that goes on by these forces you always see the OBCs, the Dalits, and the Adivasis being used as the foot soldiers and as cannon fodder. Uh, and you will have one or two Brahmins uh, at the top who will be controlling that entire group of people who are actually carrying this out on the ground. So, what are your views on this? See, uh, your uh, formulation is correct, except that the Brahmin or the RSS worker or the BJP worker who's coordinating, coordinating this will not be visible to you. He's behind the curtain. And these other sections, subaltern sections, one can see. Uh, this is called subaltern Hindutva. What does that mean? That RSS has made it a special point to go and do service work amongst these communities. Service work means they go to these communities, they try to revive their icon. Like there is one Suhail Dev in North India, Pasi community. So they have now glorified Suhail Dev, giving it anti-Muslim slam. So the whole Pasi community, you are winning over. In uh, Bengal, Matua, again, backward community. So BJP went and tried to make some Matua temple, so they became happy. So there are three mechanisms of winning over these sections. One is to pick up their icon and uh, glorify them. Second is to do service work 
like we are the only organization which are able to do the community work all over india and third there is a social engineering my social engineering uh, mn shrinivas what he says that lower caste tend to emulate the upper caste feeling that those values are good so this social engineering yes. process is three processes the fourth one is that they are able to successfully buy buy the leaders of these communities leaders of these communities mm-hmm. by luring them to some post here in india so these by four mechanisms they are trying to practice the subaltern hinduism hindutva subaltern hindutva through which these sections become their foot soldiers also in this group they should be you will try that in many of the reserve constituency adivasi bjp is leading the game because from 1970s they are doing it in many of the dalit communities they have a good uh, say called they have samajik samrastha manch which is continuously working among yes Like absolutely and and it's it's really worrisome you know when you look at uh, you know it's just the same old the same old pattern uh, is just put into a new skin and presented in front of people it's uh, it's it's quite diabolical at <laughs> at uh, many levels which brings me to the next question sir according to you what is the path forward for hindus uh, you are a hindu i am a hindu and we don't believe in what the rss does so how do we reclaim our way of life and the narrative that all hindus are like the rss and how do you view the mandate in this light and why yeah, sir and if you see uh, india has about 79% hindus india has 79% hindus. bjp at the best had got i think close to 50% of the votes in all hindus are mm. not for the bjp that is number one number two you see that in the recent elections which we have held in 2024 do india alliance did not win the election but uh, this defeat was also like a victory defeat was also like a victory because bjp had it was the all the organization supporting it ed it cbi uh, and uh, all the corporate sections so it was not just bjp alone bjp was involved in school and in the nda parties while uh, india had fought on its own but india fought mainly because it could raise the issue of constitution and i think for hindus uh, those who are hindus practicing hindus Or born in Hindu families like me, the past is that of Gandhi and Nehru. The past is that of Indian Constitution. And uh, in US, there is an organization called Hindus for Human Rights. Hindus for Human Rights. So we are a section to either these Hindus are born in Hindu families and uh, related to Hindu culture very deeply. We have that part. where we stand for indian constitution which gives us full liberty to practice our religion but to oppose that interpretation of our religion which is totally contrary to the values of deeper hindu culture so that is something what is our big challenge which we have to keep to keep struggling for absolutely and so i also would like to add here that you know the hinduism is also uh, somewhere people have also forgotten that, that hinduism is 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 plurality embodied you know if if i choose to be an agnostic if i identify myself as an agnostic i can still be a hindu a practicing hindu i can i can believe in two gods and i can be a hindu i can believe in one god and be a hindu i can believe in multiple gods and be a hindu so the 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 plurality and the immensity of what hinduism has represented through time and still does uh that somehow seems to be replaced by this one of course their obsession with one everything one nation one election one this one that so i mean how how did i mean 
for my mind it's completely you know hypocritical like how can you try try to uh, you know envelop what hinduism is with one single identity how do you how do you see this see hinduism has multiple traditions multiple traditions i'll begin with an interesting story about amartya sen amartya sen he won the nobel prize when he came come came to meet his grandfather his grandfather asked him what religion you follow so amartya sen said i am an atheist so his grandfather said oh so you belong to the gnostic tradition of hinduism So this is what Hinduism is. Uh, while right from atheists like Charva and the uh, Lokayat tradition to those believing in polytheism, to those who believe in monotheism, to those believing in abstract single god as a power, so all that mm-hmm. is a, a part of this glorious tradition, which uh, which is there to take support for we. we can go by that path which is the actually real hindu tradition and from that is uh, rss rss hinduism rss hinduism in the sense narrow sectarian and as you said one 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 in hinduism on the contrary many 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 at all the levels there is durga somewhere there is shiva somewhere there is ram somewhere there is a uh, ayappa uh, somewhere so this is what Hinduism basically stands for. So, in, in reply to their one, we have to say many, many, and which is the truth, which is the truth. Like, uh, so that is where I think many of us have failed to underline this fact, which Mahatma Gandhi in his life very successfully practiced, preached. And he said, "My life is my message." That's why you see, even at the time of independence, he was not part of the celebrations of the independence. the person who led the independent movement was not there to celebrate the fruits of independent movement because he was more interested in communal harmony and trying to douse the fire of communal hatred so this is the path for those who call themselves hindu born in hindu families to struggle against this uh, distortion of uh, hindu values and political forces Okay. which you know brings me to one last question so before we uh, we come to the end um you know as a result of what we've seen the the hindu majoritarianism in the past decade and its meteoric rise um it has led to of course the opposition has fought a very long hard fought battle and the opposition has certainly given adequate representation to all sections to the minorities as well as all the castes but you see the the end result of this you know meteoric rise of majoritarianism that today we see the minorities becoming invisibilized especially the muslim make this this regime modi 3.0 or you know nda whatever you call it they, they themselves are confused about it um you don't see a single muslim member of parliament in their cabinet nor were they given tickets by the bjp there is not a single uh, christian minister union minister uh, in this cabinet so there is there is extensive invisibilization of uh, entire populations of people how how do you view this see this fits very very much into their agenda their mm-hmm. whole agenda of hindu rashtra in which hindus have a primacy <coughs> hindus have a primacy and muslims and christians they are they have a secondary marginal role so they are uh, in last one decade they have tried to bring forth this politics through their various actions and i see it as a part of that that uh, they have done it given last ten decades uh, two decades and appear also in uh, their party There is hardly representation of uh, Muslim. One Muslim or two Muslim ministers were there at one time. Then also they dumped them, and uh, not a single Muslim and two was given a ticket for MP. Now, of course, they are trying to make some outreach to section of Muslim communities, but that is again for the sake of electoral purposes, not for empowering them or 
giving them any power. So this I will say is a core agenda of Hindu nation, Hindu nationalism, where minorities have to live either as ghettos, either as ghettos, are totally invisibilized in the national life of the country. So this is what they are trying to achieve. So in a way, this should be smiling in his sleeves that uh, last uh, one decade their agenda has gone few notches up with invisibilization of Muslims, ghettoization of Muslims, and intimidation or reception of Christian community. Absolutely. Well, sir, thank you so much for taking the time uh, and sharing your lovely insights. By the way, I'm also one of your fans from such a long time. Uh, I I salute you for the courage you've had from the time you started speaking up till now. You've been consistently, you know, educating people. I learned so much from you uh, along my own political journey. So really, thank you so much for what you do. Thank you so much, sir. And for all the viewers, if you have liked this this interview come conversation that we had with uh, Dr. and Professor Ram Ponyani ji. Please do like, comment, share and subscribe to the channel and particularly share this message with our Hindu brothers and sisters and our brothers from the minorities and sisters from the minorities too, because everybody needs to understand that Hinduism and if, if this mandate was anything to go by, majority of Hindus does, do not support the ideology of this regime. And we are standing united and strong together as Indians. Thank you so much. You. Till the next segment, we will meet you again. Thank you. Matashto Vishesha video Kalanu Nodalu, Matu Hosa video Kalabagay Tirialu, Edina.com YouTube channel subscribe Madi, Matu bell icon click Madi.